We did it! Ladies and gentlemen, we got through the entire Honest Hearts DLC, finished all of the story, and now we can reward ourselves with the loot. That's right, this episode is about every awesome piece of loot that we can walk away with after completing Honest Hearts. Let's start with weapons. The major new addition to New Vegas, thanks to Honest Hearts, is the 44 caliber auto pistol. This is a beautiful little pistol used by Joshua Graham and his dead horses. You'll have to forgive my character here. I have a mod installed that changes idle animations and it appears to be conflicting with this weapon, which is why she's not actually holding it by the grip. Anyway, Joshua Graham tells us that he and his tribe used the 45 caliber auto pistol because it was invented by one of his ancestors. This type of 45 automatic pistol was designed by one of my tribe almost 400 years ago. Learning its use is a new Canaanite rite of passage. He is referring to John Browning, a Mormon who lived in Ogden, Utah, which is where we find New Canaan in the Fallout universe, who became famous as a firearms designer. He designed many weapons that were revolutionary for their day, including the M1917 and M1919 30 caliber air-cooled machine guns, the M250 caliber machine gun, the Browning automatic rifle, and the Browning Auto 5 semi-automatic shotgun. But probably his most famous invention was the M1911 pistol. At the time, it was a revolutionary design, and it has since been imitated by pistol manufacturers around the world, which is why it's such a conventional design. What was revolutionary in his day is very commonplace in ours. The M1911 was first produced in 1911, making it a very old design. And like in New Vegas, the real-world version uses a 45 caliber automatic Colt pistol cartridge. The pistol has iron sights, making it easy to aim, and there are two mods available for this weapon, the 45 Auto Pistol Heavy Duty Slide, which increases the weapon's condition, and the 45 Auto Pistol Silencer, which silences the weapon. We can buy these modifications from Joshua Graham himself, or after we've completed the DLC, after Joshua Graham leaves, we can buy them from Vendertron. Presumably the Happy Trails Expedition is now able to exchange goods with the new Canaanites, making these weapons and mods available in the Mojave Wasteland. And this is true for all of the mods in this DLC. Adding these mods to the weapon changes the look of the gun, giving it a brand new silencer and just all around being fantastic. Next up is the 45 caliber automatic submachine gun. These weapons are used by the White Legs who call them storm drums. They came upon them after looting a US Army and National Guard armory that was filled with these things. These suckers are 11 pounds, making it the heaviest SMG in the game. It also has a pretty high spread, making it difficult to use outside of vats. However, it does come with two mods that can help alleviate these issues. We can install a 45 caliber auto SMG extended drum which simply increases the ammo capacity, and a compensator, which helps reduce spread. This is what the gun looks like with both mods installed. The weapon is loosely based on the Thompson submachine gun, particularly in the way the drum, grip, and stock look. However, it's not an exact replica. Next up is She's Embrace. I showed you how to get this fist weapon in my video on Waking Cloud and the Ghost of She. After we complete that quest, Whitebird crafts this thing and gives it to us. This weapon is a unique Yaogwai gauntlet that has considerably more durability than most unarmed weapons. However, it is quite large and covers most of the screen when you're using it. When compared to the Yaogwai gauntlet, it does five more damage and nearly 12 more DPS, making it significantly better Better than the Algwai Gauntlet. And it looks just like it should, a giant dismembered bear claw right on your hand. Next up is the Compliance Regulator. We find this in Fallen Rock Cave. This is the first cave we visit when tracking down Randall Clark. I talked a little bit about this in my video on Follows Chalk. The thing that makes it unique compared to other laser weapons is that it has a chance to stun your enemy for 10 or so seconds. Some of the drawbacks are that it doesn't have true iron sights. It's a little hard to aim, but it is considered a holdout weapon. And if you shoot fast enough, it's possible to keep larger enemies in a 
perpetual state of paralysis. You have a chance to paralyze enemies with each attack, and the paralysis does stack. So if an enemy is paralyzed after having already been paralyzed, they have to wait out the second paralyzation before they stand up. In this way, we can take down significantly stronger enemies simply by keeping them at a perpetual state of paralyzation. Next up is the Firebomb, the only unique throwable explosive in this DLC. The Firebomb is a lot like a Molotov cocktail, only instead of being made from any random bottle, it's made with a Sunset Sarsaparilla bottle. It also differs in that if you kill someone with a final hit with this thing, it turns your enemy into a big pile of green goo, kind of like if you killed them with a plasma weapon. It's a decent explosive. One of the only drawbacks is that it does have a small effect radius, which is not a big deal if you use them exclusively in vats, but if you're trying to be effective with these by simply throwing them, you're gonna have to have pretty good aim. Next up is the Tomahawk, one of the new unique throne weapons in this DLC. It has the most damage of any other throne weapon in the game, greater than the throwing hatchet, clocking in at 30 damage per attack, making it superior to the throwing hatchet in both damage and DPS. But my favorite thing about it is the way it looks. They really spent a long time thinking about the design of this thing and trying to make it really feel like it came from a wasteland. The handle is made from PVC piping. And the blade is not made with sharpened stone, but instead with railroad spikes. My favorite bit is that they use an old electrical extension cord as rope to tie the spikes to the PVC. I'm not sure if this would be a very practical real world design, but I love the way it looks. And it does feel very wastelandy. Wastelandish. Wastelanderific. Next up is the War Club. This is the signature weapon of the Dead Horses tribe. We got a close-up look at Follows Chalk's weapon in an earlier video. It's a great little blunt melee weapon, and it's the fastest one in the game. If you have a melee skill of 50 or greater, using it in vats you get a special melee attack called Lights Out, which does an additional 125% damage at the cost of five more action points. It comes with two weapon mods, the first is called War Club Honors, which increases attack speed by 25%, and the next is called War Club Casings, which increases damage by 5. These appear on the model in the form of beads wrapped around it, those are the honors, and the mane of the horse, those are the casings. After using these mods, this weapon has a DPS almost as high as weapons that typically require 100 melee weapon skill points to use which makes it a wonderful weapon for those who don't have a high melee skill but still want a powerful melee weapon. Next up is the standard Yaogwai Gauntlet, and it looks much like She's Embrace. Like She's Embrace, it has a bonus to critical damage and critical chance, but it does a lot less damage and a lot less DPS than She's Embrace, and since all you have to do to get She's Embrace is one fairly easy quest, it's not that useful unless you're using it to repair your She's Embrace. Next is Salt Upon Wound's Power Fist. It's one of the more powerful fist weapons in the game, surpassed only by the Saturnite Fist Superheated from Old World Blues and the Industrial Hand from Lonesome Road. It has 45 damage, bringing the DPS up to 64, but the thing that's unique about it is it's got a poison effect that does 3 damage over 10 seconds with every hit. This poison effect also makes enemies dizzy for a brief moment, giving you more chances to strike. It's got a great little look, painted white with red tribal markings on it. A great little tool for those of you who wield power fists. Next up is one of my favorite weapons in this DLC, A Light in Shining Darkness. This is Joshua Graham's personalized and engraved 45 caliber auto pistol. Unlike the other ones, it's silver in appearance, and it has a rattlesnake skin grip to match Joshua Graham's boots and belt. On either side of the weapon, it's engraved in Greek. Now you'll have to forgive me, it's been a long time since I've taken Greek. Kaitophos en te scotia feine, and then on the other side, kai e scotia ato au katelaben. This, as to be expected, is a biblical quote. This is John 1 5, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The phrase is used fairly often in the Doctrines and Covenants, which is one of the standard works of the Mormon Church, making it quite a suitable inscription for this weapon. It's different from all of the other auto pistols. Instead of having the notch in front post, you aim down this little groove, this 
trench in the top of the weapon. It also has a unique skeletonized hammer and trigger. It's considered a holdout weapon, but sadly, like most unique weapons, it does not accept weapon modifications. To compensate for that, it does four more damage than a typical 45 auto pistol, bringing its DPS to 144, which is more than 80 greater than the 45 caliber auto pistol. Incidentally, this is simultaneously the lightest and smallest pistol in the game, lighter and smaller than even the 9mm pistol and Maria. And finally, my favorite weapon in the DLC is the Survivalist's Rifle. We find this rifle in the duffel bag near the body of Randall Clark. The Survivalist's Rifle is a unique variant of the Service Rifle. It is significantly better than the Service Rifle, having a damage of 48 compared to a damage of 18. That's 30 more damage than your typical Service Rifle. That brings the DPS of this weapon up to 187. There are all sorts of wonderful quirks about this gun. If you look above the magazine on the rifle's right side, we find a star along with the words, Property of U.S. Government Checkpoint, Carbine 12.7 millimeter caliber. Above the trigger, we find the words Long Branch Arsenal, Ontario, U.S. Territory. On the stock of the gun, we find two words. On one side of the gun, scratched in English, we find the word stop. And on the alternate side, we find the word arret. And I'm probably mangling the pronunciation of that, but it's a French word, which means stop or halt. All of this tells us that this is likely Randall Clark's personal weapon, not one that he found here, because from his terminal entries we learned that he went to Canada as a U.S. soldier during the occupation and annexation of Canada in Fallout lore. That would explain why the word stop or halt is written in French on his weapon, and why in his terminal entry he expresses disgust at what the U.S. did in Canada. The most unique thing about this weapon is if you try to aim with iron sights, the forward sight is bent out of line with the rear channel on top of the carrying handle, at first making it harder to aim. It looks like the little notches in the front are off to the left a little bit, and so it's confusing. Do I move the point of the weapon to the right to put the enemy between the two little prongs, or what's the best way to aim this thing? Well, to use it correctly, just place the enemy at the very top of the rightmost prong when using Using iron sights. If you align that prong with the body of your enemy, you should hit him every time. Now this isn't a mistake. This isn't an error in the weapon's mesh. This was intentional. When doing research, I learned that Joshua Sawyer, one of the developers of the game, chose to have this sight bent to convey decades of use and wear. It has clamps on the foregrip. The wood itself is mismatched, made from furniture and other places. Sawyer said that the survivalist either couldn't or didn't repair just because he adapted to using it as it was. Perhaps at one point in the past, he tried to affix a scope onto the weapon, which ended up bending the iron sights. And then after he removed it, he just got used to using it as it was. After learning how to use the iron sights correctly, if you aim at the right front post, it ends up not being that big of a deal. I actually really enjoy using it this way. Next up is armor. First up is Follows Chalk's headdress. This hat has a DT of 1 and increases melee damage by 5. The hat is made from a baseball cap. Specifically, it looks like a Chicago's Cubs baseball cap. It has the Chicago's Cub W on it, and it's got the Chicago Cubs shade of blue. He modified it by sticking feathers in it, and then it appears to have curtains around the back, little strips of cloth possibly actually made from curtains or old bed sheets. I suppose this protects his neck from sun damage or mosquitoes, maybe? I don't know. Next up is Daniel's hat. It also has a DT of one, but it grants plus five to speech and plus one to perception. I always thought this hat looked kinda odd on Daniel. Maybe it was in combination with his rather strange beard. But aside from the way Daniel uses it, I think it's a pretty attractive hat. To complement the hat, we get Daniel's outfit giving us a DT of two and plus five to medicine and barter. His outfit is a simple outfit. He's got a neckerchief around his neck, some sort of plaid looking shirt, patched jeans, and a big old belt buckle. 
Next is the Dead Horses Stalker Armor. This is worn by every member of the Dead Horses tribe, both the women and the men. It gives a DT of 5 and grants plus 5 to sneak. It's much less revealing than the Sorrows version. It has a sash going from the right shoulder under the left armpit. It sports a nifty necklace, a satchel that hangs on the right side, and the right shoulder is armored with a little bit of metal. Next up is the Desert Ranger armor. I showed this off in my video on Randall Clark. We find this in one of his caves. This, in my opinion, is the best armor from the DLC, and in fact, one of my favorite armors from the game. I'm going to be using this in my regular, everyday gameplay. We see a tourniquet on the leg. Randall Clark told us about this in his terminal entry. One of the Vault Dwellers got him, and he had to make a tourniquet to stop the bleeding. And we see bullet holes all up in the jacket. This outfit has seen some serious wear and tear. It comes with a riot mask, but this mask differs from the NCR version in that it has green goggles instead of red. It's made from a World War II inspired army helmet. It's highly distressed. We see lots of scratches all over it and we learn from the drawing on it that the previous owner of this helmet had served during the Yangtze campaign in China. He spent three months in Nanjing from June to August and then in September he was shipped to Shanghai where he spent the rest of the war until May. We learn the name of this man. His name was Staff Sergeant Vickers R.B., U.S. Marine Corps. Randall Clark likely found this suit of armor, either on his body after the bombs dropped, or somewhere else in the ruins of Salt Lake City when he went back to find his wife and child. On the helmet, we find the words, Forgive me, Mama, drawn on with magic marker. This may be a reference to some of the atrocities that U.S. servicemen did to Chinese civilians during the Yangtze campaign in Fallout lore. Perhaps Vickers was feeling remorse. It has the highest DT of any armor in Fallout New Vegas, equaling a full suit of T-45D power armor, even though it's still classified as a medium armor. It grants 22 DT, which is two points higher than NCR Ranger combat armor, but it has the same weight. It matches the DT of the Elite Riot Gear, although the Riot Gear is significantly lighter. Unlike the NCR Ranger armor, this is not a faction armor, so we can wear this even while around enemies of the NCR without them opening fire. The helmet has a DT of 5 and a weight of 3, making it one of the best pieces of medium armor in the game. Next up is the Gecko-backed leather armor. We can craft these. It's a light armor with 10 DT and 15 radiation poison and fire resistance. It's unremarkable. It just looks like any other suit of leather armor. Its companion is the reinforced version of this outfit, which simply has 5 more DT but it does have a different model. It looks much sturdier and comes with additional plates of armor. For those who wear heavy armor, we can now craft the gecko-backed metal armor. The metal armor has a DT of 17 and all the same resistances as the leather armor, but it does remove one agility. This version looks just like the basic metal armor and the reinforced version gives us three more DT at 20 DT with all the same stats. And it looks just like reinforced metal armor. Next up is Joshua Graham's armor. This is a light armor, but it's got pretty high DT for light armor at 15 DT. Plus, it gives us plus three critical chance. It's a handsome suit of armor made from a Salt Lake City Police Department SWAT team vest. Joshua has added many of his own personal touches to it. He's got rattlesnake skin boots, a rip in the left knee of the jeans, a rattlesnake skin belt and belt buckle. These go well with the rattlesnake grip on A Light and Shining Darkness. And then underneath the SWAT vest, he's got a white long sleeve shirt with tribal markings on the shoulders. This suit of armor has the exact same level of protection as a full suit of combat armor, but it weighs less than a third of combat armor. This gives it the fourth highest DT of any suit of armor in the light armor class, surpassed only by the Sierra Madre and Vault 34 security armor. But all of these security armors weigh twice as much as Joshua Graham's suit here. Now, of course, if our character wears this, we don't have any of the bandages that Joshua Graham wore, obviously because we are not burned and these bandages are considered part of his body rather than part of this outfit. Next up is the Park Ranger hat. I talked about this in my video on Joshua Graham. We find these in many of the abandoned ranger stations all over Zion. It's a unique little hat. It has a DT of one, but the thing that makes it special is it grants plus five to your survival skill, 
and plus one to perception, making it one of the few pieces of armor that give bonuses to survival. It's got a lovely little Zion National Park logo on the front of it, and I just love the way it looks. Next up is Salt Upon Wounds Helmet. Now, this is not what it looks like in the game. I didn't realize this at the time that I started playing this DLC, but I had a mod installed that altered the appearance of Salt Upon Wounds Helmet. This surprised me because I didn't have any mods installed that changed anything about Honest Hearts. In fact, I really went out of my way to try and make the Honest Hearts experience as authentic as possible. In fact, I didn't realize that I had a mod installed until after my first video when people started to make comments saying, hey, what mod are you using for Salt Upon Wounds Helmet? And I wish I could answer that. I don't know what mod I had installed that changed the helmet. I've installed a few mods that make armor changes to most of the armors in the game, and even though I didn't install one for Honest Hearts, I'm thinking one of those mods may have done something to Salt Upon Wounds Helmet. So since I didn't know which mod I needed to disable, I went ahead and disabled all of my mods to show you what this helmet was supposed to look like. This is the helmet in the unmodded game. And, uh... <laughs> You know, I, I like the modded version better. This one is still cool, don't get me wrong, but I do like the modded version better. It's made from the jawbone of a donkey, a brahmin, some sort of cloven hoof animal. And I'm presuming that Salt Upon Wounds could see through this visor, although it looks opaque to me. He drew a skull-like face on it, but I would just think that it would harm his visibility. One of the clever things about this helmet is the very back of it. These dreads are made from spent shotgun casings which I thought was pretty clever. The helmet is considered a light helmet. It has a DT of four, and it grants plus two to critical chance and plus five to sneak. Now, the Sorrows have two outfits. Both of them have identical stats, however. Both the Sorrows outfit and the Sorrows adorned outfit have a DT of two and plus five to survival. The traditional Sorrows outfit, I think, reflects a lot upon their culture. Since they're not a warlike tribe, it's the least armored of any of the tribal outfits, consisting just of a loincloth for men and a small bikini for the women. The basic version has a small necklace, and the adorned version instead has some sort of white stone as the necklace, plus another chain of beads. That's the only difference between the two versions. The White Legs outfit has a DT of 5 and plus 15 fire resistance. And there's a lot more going on with this. We find an ammo sash going from the left shoulder to the right. They have a white bandana to cover their face during sandstorms. On the right leg, they've got some leather armor protecting the upper thigh. And along their waist, they've got a bunch of pockets for ammunition and some Nuka-Cola bottles for storing water. It comes with shoulder pads. And overall, it's just a much more protective protective suit of armor. The White Legs Hide Armor has two more DT coming in at seven, and it also is a little bit more fortified. The shoulder pads are thicker. It now has wrist guards, a belt buckle. The thigh guard is now on the left leg instead of the right. And instead of bottles, we get a canteen on the waist. Lastly, let's tackle consumables. Honest Hearts adds a bunch of new consumables to the world, many of which we can craft at campfires. The first is black coffee. As a coffee lover, this makes me excited. We can craft this using one coffee mug, one coffee pot, one coyote tobacco chew, and one honey mesquite pod. It requires a survival skill of 15. It grants us plus five hit points, two intelligence for one minute, and costs us one agility for one minute, with these effects amplified by our survival skill. Every time you consume some black coffee, you have the possibility of being able to reuse the coffee cup, but there's also the chance to break the coffee cup. Next up is Blood Shield. We can craft this at a campfire using one barrel cactus fruit, one cave fungus, and one spore plant pod. Blood Shield heals poison, and at the same time, it heals four hit points each second for six seconds, and it gives us 50 poison resistance for a short period of time. The benefit of this also scales with our medicine skill. Next up is Dark Datura, and this is a poison for our weapons. In order to use it, we have to equip a weapon that can be poisoned. So equipping a war club or another melee weapon, we can go ahead and use the Dark Datura to poison our weapon. This poison will remove five hit points from our enemies each second for 12 seconds. It also reduces their intelligence by two for 90 seconds. We find Dark Datura on the corpses of the White Legs, and we can also craft it at campfires using two Sacred Datura Root and one Turpentine. It requires a survival skill of 45 to craft. 
To complement this poison, we've got a new anti-venom called the Datura anti-venom. All it does is cure the Datura poison but it also works on other poisons as well. We often find these on the corpses of white legs, or we can craft it at a campfire using one brock flower, one sacred datura root, one spore plant pod, and one xander root. It takes 25 in survival to craft it. Next up is the datura hide. This is a really unique consumable that gives us plus one DT. And it lasts for 60 seconds. We can craft this at a campfire using four sacred datura roots and one wonder glue. Ugh. It requires 25 in survival to craft. Note that the DT we gain from this can be stacked with the DT that we get from consuming a Nuka-Cola quartz. Speaking of Nuka-Cola, after installing Honest Hearts, we have the ability to craft Nuka-Cola and Sunset Sarsaparilla at any campfire. These are called the homemade versions of both beverages, but the stats are the same. Next up is the Daturana. This consumable restores limb condition, and it grants plus one to unarmed damage for 30 seconds, plus 15 hit points, and costs 30 agility for 30 seconds. We can craft this Daturana at a campfire if our survival skill is 65 or greater, and it costs one flower, one purified water, and one sacred Datura root. Also new with Honest Hearts is the Healing Poultice. This also restores limb condition, and it heals 5 hit points for 18 seconds, but it does cost 1 agility during that time. This Poultice shares many of the same ingredients as the Healing Powder. We can craft these at a campfire using a survival skill of 20, and it costs 1 Cave Fungus, 1 Xander Root, 1 Brock Flower, and 1 Nevada Agave Fruit. One of my favorite additions is the Large Wasteland Tequila. This tequila grants us plus three strength plus one charisma at the cost of three intelligence for four minutes, but plus two DT and plus ten poison resistance for two minutes. To craft it, we have to have a survival skill of 40 or greater, and if we do, we can go to a campfire and craft them using one large whiskey bottle, two Nevada agave fruit, and two purified water. It's great to use this as the whiskey rose perk that we get from Cass removes the negative intelligence effect, making it so that we don't suffer the negative consequences of addiction. Next up is the Sacred Datura root. This one can't be crafted, but it can be found all over Zion. After consuming it, we get poisoned and we lose two perception for 90 seconds. Additionally, anti-venom doesn't cure this. The only thing that does cure it is Datura anti-venom. Next up is Spore Carrier Sap. We find these on the bodies of Spore Carriers here in Zion. Strangely enough, they don't appear on the bodies of the Spore Carriers in Vault 22. These are unremarkable. It just heals one hit point per second for four seconds, but it is a component used in other recipes. Next are the Spore Plant Pods. We find these on Spore Plants here in Zion, but like the Sap, we don't find them on Spore Plants in Vault 22. These heal us for four hit points over six seconds and increases our poison and resistance by 25 for two minutes. Next is the Wasteland Tequila, a less amplified version of the large Wasteland Tequila. It gives us two strength and one charisma for four minutes, costing us two intelligence for four minutes. And if we have Cass as a companion and have the Whiskey Rose perk, we gain plus three damage threshold for four minutes. And it also gives us plus five to poison resistance for one minute. Remember, all of these stats can be amplified based on our survival skill. And finally, we get the Weapon Binding ritual. It restores limb condition, grants plus 10 melee and unarmed damage for two minutes at the cost of two hit points per second for two seconds. Once we use it, we get a unique screen. It says, you have sacrificed a portion of your life's blood to become one with your weapon. Your eyes will be keen, your limbs will not break, and your claws will strike like thunder. Fight only with your hands, or the weapons of your hands, to know this glory in combat. After using it, we get a strange, blurry screen effect. We find these on the bodies of white leg tribals, or we can craft them at a campfire with a melee weapon skill of 25 or greater, using one healing powder, one knife, one leather belt, and one wonder glue. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is an overview of every new piece of loot that we can walk away with after installing Honest Hearts. And with that, we bring this series to its conclusion.
I am so glad and blessed that you have stuck with me these 10 days during this series. I've had so much fun putting it together. I can't tell you how rewarding it is to be able to play these things for the first time and share my fresh experiences with all of you. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this series, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I've been reading all of your comments and I've been taking notes of many of the content suggestions that you've been giving me during this series. Starting tomorrow, I'm going to hop back in into my regular production schedule. We're gonna be doing stuff on Fallout 4, Fallout 3, and yes, of course, Fallout New Vegas. We'll be talking about mods, the Creation Club, and maybe even new games, who knows? If you like what I do, and you wanna support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers can access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, thank you so very much for watching. I hope you have a fantastic day, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.